a yoga teacher. Dr. Feldman. Welcome. The clicker? Oh, the clicker. There you go. Just press the green button to forward. Great. Well, thank you very, very much for inviting me to talk at Cisco, and I'm very excited to be part of this lovely event that you have here. I'm also excited to see this campus, which um, is new to me, and I'm excited to meet some friends, even from my own institution. So I'm going to be talking to you today about brain development. You might think that this is going to be a little bit dry and boring. I'm going to try and make it very, very pertinent to everybody who's here. I've noticed that there are a lot of little babies, a lot of people expecting babies. And what I want you to know is that the first five years of your baby's life, of your child's life, are the most important in terms of brain development. Brain development keeps going, even into adulthood. I can tell you that for sure. But it is still the most important time is the first five years of life. So what I'd like you to get out of today's talk is summarized on this slide. First, I want you to recognize that the human brain is a dynamically changing uh, organ in the body. It changes in size, to be sure, but it also changes in structure and it changes in function. The interesting thing, and this is what we've just learned, I would say in the last 10 or so years, is that the brain is changing because of learning. It's not that the, uh, only that learning occurs because of the brain, but the brain changes because of learning. There are many biological and social threats that can alter brain development, especially at the young ages. So we have to be on the lookout for them. And what I hope to do is convince you that this information is important to you as family members, as community members, and as public citizens. Okay, so let's begin with the first point. The brain is an actively, dynamically developing organ. So think about the brain a little bit like you think about the human body. You know that the body of a baby is not just a, a minuscule body of an adult, but it's different in lots of different ways. Its proportions different, its uses are different. And the human brain is very similar to the human body. What's going to change through development is first, there's going to be a rapid increase in size. Second, there's going to be lots and lots of folding in on itself. I'll tell you why that's important. Third, that number of synapses or connections between nerve cells will increase dramatically. And finally, white matter in the brain will change, and I'll tell you the importance of that. So here's some information about size. Head size grows so rapidly in the first year of life. What I have here, whoop, uh, let me go back. What I have here um, is, okay, we'll do it this way. What I have here is a growth curve about head circumference. The age is along this axis and size is along this axis. What you can see is till about 12 months of age, the slope or the rate of change is really very, very rapid. It continues rapidly, but a little less rapid as you move from one to two and three years of age. By age three, which is the end of this chart, the child's brain volume is about 80% of what it will be as an adult. And by five, the child's brain reaches about 90% of the size it'll be as an adult. So you can see how rapidly the, the brain is growing in the first five years of life. Now, it's more than just size that's changing. What's happening is the complexity of the structure is also changing. So the, the human brain starts out, actually it starts out like a plate, and the plate folds in on itself. So there's always a space in the center and a tube. And then the tube, what you can see down here, begins to become more and more and more complex. And it folds in on itself as it approaches the birth period, which is here, and continues folding in on itself all the way into adult, uh, adult years. So why is this infolding important? Because it increases the surface area, and it's that increase in surface area, the increase in the amount of space for nerves and nerve connections that dramatically improves far greater than just the volume itself. So it's this high surface area that we think is um, associated with the human intellectual capacity and why it's so much more impressive than, let's say, even our closest primate relatives. 
Here's another example where you can see the infolding much more closely. So these are MRI scans of infant brains. And you're seeing this as if we took the skull open like this and just kind of looked at one slice. So this is the brain of a preterm baby that's born almost four months early. And then you can see how the edges begin to infold by 28 weeks and 30 weeks. And even by birth, the appearance of the brain is dramatically different than the appearance of the brain three to four months earlier. And that infolding is an important feature. Now, another thing that's happening is that there is a change in synapses. So I'm going to give you a little brief primer on what's a synapse. A synapse is a cleft or a space between two nerve cells. So here we have a transmitting nerve cell. It's a complex structure. It has a nucleus. And it has these little arms that are reaching out to accept electrical stimulation from neighbors. When this cell decides to fire, electricity goes down this one arm called the axon until it comes to the end. Then there's a little gap and one of the dendrites of the receiving cell is there on the other side of that gap. What happens is that the electricity coming down the emitting nerve cell uh, affects little vesicles at the tip here and chemicals or neurotransmitters float into the synaptic cleft. On the dendritic side, there are receptors that accept those uh, chemicals and it's the chemical energy that converts to electrical energy and continues moving down the next nerve cell. It's very interesting because a lot of medications that we use to change brain function work someplace in this system, either changing the neurotransmitters or the receptors or something about the activity in that cleft. Now from a developmental standpoint, here's what's really important. The number of synapses grows dramatically in the first few years of life. So here you can get a feel that they're nerve cells and they're kind of disparate and separate in this, um, this is a histologic section from a brain of a newborn. By six months, just looking visually, you can see that there's way more nerve cells, but even way more connections among nerve cells. And that continues to develop till two years of age. Now what happens after that, here's again age down here, this is the first year of life and this is after, and this is the number of synapses here. You see synapses grow rapidly, rapidly, even before birth, but particularly in the first year of life. And then depending upon the neural system, there is a slight decline in the nerve cells after that peak. Now, what we've come to learn is that synapses get used, that get used a lot remain active and remain present. But synapses that aren't used a lot actually are pruned. You know, think about your little rose bush. If you have a little weak spindly branch, you might decide to clip that off so that the rest of the flowers look a lot better. So similarly, synapses that are used a lot are maintained. Synapses that aren't used are pruned. And what we know is that if you use it, it's good. If you don't use it, you lose it. So again, in the first few years of life, when we want a lot of active learning experiences, it's so that these synapses grow and are maintained. Now, another thing that's going on in the brain relates to white matter. So let me give you a little primer on white matter. Here's again our friend, the nerve cell. Here are those dendrites, here's the cell nucleus, and here's the axon. The axon, remember where the, the message goes out from the nerve cell, is actually coated in something called myelin. And that myelin is a little like insulation on wires. And um, in the insulation there are gaps, so these little nodes. What happens then is the electricity doesn't have to go all the way down the the axon directly, which can be very slow, it can hop between these nodes and get to its conclusion um, really much more quickly. So when we slice the brain now, I'm slicing the brain this way. Like imagine the princess wearing her crown. I'm slicing it like the princess's crown. 
This is the cell bodies out here, so-called gray matter, and this part in here is white matter. That's the, those myelinated or insulated axons. That color, the color of the insulation is white, so it appears white. And you can see that there's a lot of white matter inside the brain. This is a little space that comes from that tube that we talked about before. Now, if we look at changes in white matter over time, you can see that in this baby, you don't even see very clear delineation of the white matter. By about a year, you begin to see it's looking like that, that picture I showed you before, and by two years, even more clearly. So white matter is developing rapidly, and that means that the, the axons are becoming myelinated and the movement of electrical impulses is increasing as time goes on. Here's another way to look at it. This is a cut of the brain as if you sliced it this way down in half. And the white matter is this colorful midline um, feathery structure. And I hope you can appreciate that here it's very like airy and you can see through. By the time we're an adult, it's very, very thick because the connections across the midline have become extremely dense. And here's another way of looking at it. Here's myelination in the first important five years of life. This is age and months. This is the amount of myelinated uh, white matter. And here are the blue, our sensory motor pathways like vision and hearing. And uh, the green and the red represent areas of the brain that are important for language. What I think is interesting for those of you who have young babies is that the myelin is actually being prepared even before language development begins, which is sometime around here. So you want to give the baby lots of good experiences even before he or she begins to talk so that those areas of brain are prepared for language learning. Now, this is the material that I think is, in, to me, the most revolutionary that we've learned over the last couple of years the brain actually changes through the act of learning. So imagine that, um, well, let's, let's think about it, the real situation first. You buy a computer, right? You buy a computer and you have to make a decision about what programs you want on that computer, right? You say, I want you know, this word program and this database program and something else. And that's what you get, right? Um, the human brain isn't designed like that. The human brain begins to learn and the software develops because of the act of learning. And so it's a very, very um, keen and sensitive system to the environment the child finds herself in. Um, and what we know is that learning is facilitated <coughs> by warm, meaningful social interactions um, and also by rich um, like learning experiences. So here's some examples just to prove my case. This is the a brain scan of a normal person. Again, this is a slice, like you opened up the skull and looked in. You can see that this scan is a little old, so it doesn't have as clear differentiation. But this one shows you what happens with neglect. So the size is different, the spaces interiorly are much bigger, and all of those important um, things that we talked about, um, synapses and myelin are probably much less present in this brain than this brain. So this shows you on the negative side what happens if you don't have good rich learning experiences. This is an example that shows you on the positive side and here for those of you who are adults in the audience, I think most of you, um, is some encouraging news. So this was a study that was done to see if the brain would change through experience and they had to think about okay what's the What's the activity or what's the learning that we're going to ask of people? And so they decided to use juggling. And juggling is interesting because you can teach it to children of lots of ages. It's not something that most people know. So it was easy to find people who were willing to learn juggling. You couldn't do this with reading because we want everybody to learn to read. So juggling was a really nice example. So in this study, uh, adults had um, about six weeks of juggling training. And then they went through scans pre and post. And what was found is first that a certain area of the brain was far more active in the, um, in the adults that had learned juggling than their companions who weren't yet taught juggling. And these, uh, these areas light up when we do functional imaging. This is an area of brain that's involved in visual motor integration. 
And the second thing not represented on the slide is that the white matter going to this area of the brain also developed in a six week period when adults were learning this new skill. So this shows you that the brain is changing as a function of learning. Now, third important point is that there are threats to that. And those threats may be biological and those threats may be psychosocial. So one of the threats, one of the ones that I've been spending a lot of time on is prematurity. So um, as you probably know, we hope that a gestation lasts for about 40 weeks, but it may terminate early. Um, the limits of viability are about four months early. And those children who are born early are at risk for lots and lots of different complications. Um, so here are some of the neurologic uh, consequences of prematurity. Here is one of those MRI scans of a term, infant at term. And you can see that we have the infolding, we have a little sense of white matter beginning to develop. In this, um, in this system, this is the, those ventricles or spaces in the brain. This is the brain of a baby who was born 10 weeks early, taken at the same age as this baby. And you can see lots of changes. You can see the brain is not filling the skull. There's more space. It hasn't grown in size. This is fluid. And this is the white matter. And this white matter is too bright. It's, a, it's injured white matter. So those are some of the changes that can occur if a baby comes early. So anything we can do to postpone a preterm birth is really helpful. Those of you who are carrying babies, this is not to send you home worried, but it is to say eat well, rest a lot, um, and have warm and meaningful social interactions yourselves. This is another so slide of complications. Sometimes there's injury and the spaces in the brain begin to expand to fill out um, the missing areas and also because there's been some injury. Here's another um, threat to brain development, and that's um, alcohol exposure in utero. So this is an extreme example. This, again, is the brain of a newborn baby, and this is the brain of a six-week-old baby with fetal alcohol syndrome who passed away. This is a post-mortem specimen. So we don't know how much alcohol is okay and how much alcohol is not okay. We don't know when alcohol is most likely to affect a fetus. And so the recommendations are keep away from it, right? As much as you can throughout the pregnancy because it's not doing um, much good for the infant. If you find out um, that you're pregnant and you have been drinking, it's not necessarily going to be uh, a disaster. But from that point on, it would be very good to um, avoid alcohol. Now here's another thing that you may not have been aware of. And that is that high levels of stress or distress can also disrupt brain development. And so some people in the Developing Child uh, Center at Harvard have devised this three-level um, system for thinking about stress. Some stress is good. So the stress of figuring out a math problem that you didn't know you could figure out, that's really good stress because it's positive. It gives you a lot of energy. It shows you you're competent. Um, so that's called positive stress. It's usually brief, and it, it, it leaves very, very transient impacts on the body systems. This yellow area is tolerable stress. It tends to be more serious, but it's temporary, or it's modulated by having warm, meaningful social relationships, um, supportive relationships. So it, too, is not too detrimental. But the third kind of stress is detrimental to children, and it's called toxic stress. And this is stress that's prolonged, it's severe, it's um, unrelenting, it's without any social support for the child. And um, these, this is the kind of stress we'd like to avoid. Um, here's the brain cell of a mouse that lived in a normal um, environment. And now I hope you're getting used to seeing these kind of nerve cells in schematic. And here is the brain cell of a mouse that lived in a highly stressful environment, what we would call toxic stress. And you can see an actual reduction in the amount of differentiation of the nerve cell. And we think it's that the stress hormones themselves are detrimental to the brain. So you know we talk about the fight or flight response in stress. That's a, a sympathetic response and a cortisol response. And probably those chemicals in the brain 
are not conducive to the growth of um, brain tissue. Unfortunately, poverty has many features associated with it that can lead to suboptimal brain development. So first, uh, children may have inadequate and variable nutrition, poor health care, reduced exposure to learning opportunities, and increased risks of toxic stress. So poverty often robs children of learning potential. And the areas of brain that seem to be the most vulnerable are the areas of the brain that are associated with what we call executive function, which is controlling your behavior, planning, remembering, and um, overseeing the rest of the thinking process. And another part of the brain that's quite vulnerable are the communication areas, which are really important to me because communication is what cements human relationships. So the final thing that I want you to know is that these experiences actually can make changes in the genes that control nervous function. And so again, this is a revolutionary part of uh, medical science and psychological science in the last decade or so. And the area is called epigenetics, and it's that the experiences we have actually change the genes we have. So again, here's our friendly nerve cell that you've seen before. Inside the nucleus are the genes. The genes are making proteins. The proteins include some of those neurotransmitters that go across the synaptic cleft so that um, electrical impulses can be transmitted. And what happens is that these little markers here are, um, are chemicals and signals that can attach to genes and change the way that the genes do their work of making proteins. And so then you have a kind of a temporary or permanent change in the function of that nerve cell as a function of your experience. So, what does this all mean for you, you in the audience? First, I have implications for you as family members. The first thing that you want to do is cultivate the brain just like you would the human body. So you know that the human body, especially the human body of little babies like you, need good nutrition and they also need good physical exercise. So think about what is the equivalent for the brain. The brain needs warm, nurturing social relationships and meaningful learning experiences. And one of the best ways to do that is to talk with your child. You don't want to just talk at your child or talk around your child because we actually have new data that says that doesn't make much of a difference in how your child learns. But you want to talk to your child and you want your child to take the lead. So your child picks up the balloon and you go, oh, you've got the balloon. Look at the balloon. It's a pink balloon and you want to follow the child's lead in that communication. It's a wonderful nurturing experience for the brain as well as for the child. Reading is a particularly valuable experience because it's a time when children are just you know, uh, surrounded by language directed to them. So even babies who don't yet read can sit with their parents or grandparents or neighbors or extended family and look at books. It's not important to go through it word by word, but it is lovely to sit with children around books because the amount of language they'll hear at that moment is about two or three times greater than the amount of language they hear even in other kinds of play. So another implication for you as family members is to reduce any high levels of stress that you can, and especially those uh, kinds of stress that leave your child feeling helpless and hopeless. So um, here are some examples of things you might be able to do. In a new situation, you can prepare the child for what's going to happen with discussion or pictures, and you can have a family, a familiar caregiver, a family member present for a new and potentially stressful situation. That might take something that was tolerable or toxic stress and move it down a notch. I think trying to spare children exposure to intrafamilial conflict is really important. When children hear loud fighting or, or especially um, physical aggression between parents or other family members, that really help, uh, leaves them feeling helpless and hopeless. So uh, conflict should be managed uh, verbally and in private um, and with as quick resolution as possible. 
think as much as possible, it's important to have steady caregivers and not frequent changes in caregivers. It's fantastic. I learned today that Cisco has some, um, some child care experiences. And so if you can have steady people in a daycare center as well as in your home life, that's really ideal. And if parents have um, untreated mental health problems that impact the way that they care for their baby, it's important to get them treatment. And one of the most common um, is depression. And as you know, maternal depression in particular is um, more common after pregnancy than in other times in the life cycle. And it's very, very hard for babies when, when their parents, especially their mothers, are depressed because they don't get the expected social interaction that they, um, that they need. And they become themselves sometimes depressed or angry or disorganized. So if as a parent you begin feeling depressed, sad, unable to get out of bed, unable to interact meaningfully with your child, that's a great time to go get help. Um, if you worry about your child's development, that's an important thing to acknowledge because there are lots of reasons, biological um, included, where children don't make the developmental progress that we expect. So the first thing to do is just continue to nurture your child and make sure that the experiences are ideal. Then, if need be, get the opinion of somebody you trust, maybe a knowledgeable professional, maybe somebody like a pediatrician. Um, if the pediatrician's impulses and instincts don't match up with yours and you still are worried, get a second opinion. Get an evaluation of your child if need be. Enroll the child in therapeutic services. Again, the first uh, months and years of life are important, even if your child is on a different developmental trajectory. Learn the strategies to help your child get together with parents who are in similar situations and continue to nurture your child. Now, how about for you guys as community members? What does it mean? What does this information about brain development mean for you as uh, you know, residents of Santa Clara County or San Mateo County? Well, um, I think that it's really important to recognize that we should support organizations, agencies, and services that provide care for children and care for families, particularly at the young, uh, at young ages. So here are a couple of my favorites. First Five, we have a contract with First Five to try and provide some services um, and uh, some support to the other agencies and organizations that provide care to children in poverty and also children with developmental disorders. One of the really nice programs um, that I'm, I'm particularly proud of is Touch Points. This is Dr. T. Barry Brazelton. Some of you may have read his books. He was one of my professors when I was in training. And Touch Points is a method by which all members of the community can come together to support families, particularly in their first three years of life. It's recognition that it's hard to be a parent of a baby. And if everybody in the community pulls together, it's much easier. So if the doorman at the uh, Manhattan apartment holds the door open for the mommy with the stroller, that's a heck of a lot better than if the doorman is oblivious to the mommy with the stroller. The bus driver who, who dips the bus so that it's easier to bring the stroller on. The, um, the, the cashier at the checkout line who is tolerant of a crying baby. All those kinds of interactions are helpful to you as parents and as family members. So you want to support things like touch points because it helps you in the end. I'm particularly keen on an organization called Abilities United. I'm on the board. And we actually have representatives from Cisco on the board. I'm very proud to call Jerry King a friend. And we now have a, a second board member. Abilities United is um, a place where children can get therapeutic services at young ages if their development is not um, exactly what you expect. And it doesn't have to be that your child has a diagnosis of a disability. It could be that your child is experiencing some delays or some differences, and you just want a little bit more of a rich, enriched learning environment for your child. If your child does have an actual disability, there are certainly therapists and teachers who can help. And one of the other programs I'm really proud of at Abilities United is called Milestones Preschool. This is an inclusive preschool. It brings together children 
um, with disabilities and children without disabilities. And I have to tell you, that is a really outstanding learning experience for both groups of children. So the children with disabilities are stimulated and encouraged by the children without disabilities, and the children without disabilities learn tolerance, learn leadership, learn uh, excellent communication skills for supporting their friends with disabilities. So it's something to consider as you look around for daycare opportunities. And the last thing I want to talk about is what does this mean for you as citizens, citizens of a county, a state, and the United States. So on this slide, you'll see that this red line is what I've been talking about as the brain growth during life. So here's age and here's percent of total brain growth. And you know that it goes rapidly up in the first five years of life and then it kind of steadies. This dark line here is the line of public spending for children and families. And what you can see is that it has a very different shape. So during infancy and preschool years, we invest very little in children. When they get to elementary school, we invest a little bit more, in high school a little bit more. But then we're investing out here in job training and also in juvenile justice. So one thing to think about is what would life be like for us as citizens if these curves were a little bit more aligned? Can intervention make a difference? So, um, this is a slide from the Perry Preschool Project. The Perry Preschool Project was done in the 70s, and what was really cool about it was it was a, a randomized clinical trial. Like we usually think about clinical trials with medication. This was a randomized clinical trial about early intervention for children who were at risk for developmental disorders on the basis of extreme poverty. Half the children got early intervention and, and preschool, the other half didn't. So the treated group got the intervention, the untreated group or the control group did not. So the treatment group is with the dashed lines, it's a little bit lighter, and the untreated group is the solid lines. So in the 80s, the, the, the belief was, oh, the early intervention only makes a difference while it's ongoing, because we saw IQ go up while the children were in the program, but over the next few years, it drifted down. And by the time the children were, oh, about eight or 10, there was no difference between the treated group and the untreated group. But thankfully, the people who did the Perry Preschool Project stayed in touch with these children for a long time. So here's what happens when they're about 19 years old. Again, the treatment group is the dark group and the untreated group is the light group. The percentage who use special education, much less if they were in the treatment group. The, the percentage that were high achievers at age 14, much higher in the treatment group regardless of what their IQ was. And the, the um, ones who graduated from high school on time and as expected, again, much higher in the treatment group. They continued to watch these children to age 27, and we found that the children who could earn a better income were greater from the treatment group. To own their own home was higher in the treatment group. Never be on welfare was higher in the treatment group. And a slide I'm not showing you is that the number who were arrested or incarcerated was much lower in the treatment group. So what you can see is that lifelong, a dollar invested in early childhood programming brings someplace between four and $18 worth of gain at, you know, depending upon where in the lifespan you look at the, uh, the return on investment. In these studies, you get about an $18 return on investment for a dollar spent on a program that began at age four. So why do we need public funding and public support? The business model for early childhood care and education and for early intervention services with children who need therapy is just very hard to make break even. And that's because we can't have classrooms of 30 children when they're you know, a year of age. So the economics is not in favor of people being able to afford this out of their own pocket. When you work at a fabulous organization like Cisco, you have subsidized early care and education, and that, that can work really well. Um, if you don't have the, the blessing of a fabulous organization, then you're often on your own. And 
what happens is that if you have a, a child who has delays and disabilities, parents often cut back on their work because they have more to do at home. And so that actually cuts back into their ability to finance the um, the services. So public funding can be conceptualized as a wise investment for brain development and for positive child outcomes. So let me tell you again what I've tried to emphasize today in this talk. The human brain is a developing organism and it develops most rapidly and most differentially in the first five years of life. The brain actually develops through the act of learning that continues, thankfully for us, all the way into adulthood, but it's the rates of change are much greater in the first five years of life. And biological and social threats may alter brain structure and function, as well as gene expression. So your call to action, as a parent or family member, create healthy learning environments for your child. As a community member, support local agencies and services for children and families in whatever way you can. Maybe it's volunteering, maybe it's just attitudinal, talking over you know, the dinner table with people who don't know about this information and getting them enthusiastic about supporting organizations locally. Um, or maybe it's financial support because you know that the business model is really problematic. And as a citizen, I urge you to support public investment in young children and their families, including high quality community preschools, early intervention services for children at risk or with delays, and inclusive education at all ages. Thank you so very much for your uh, kind attention. <clears throat> I, think I, I think I'm okay to take a couple of questions. Yes, sir. How bad is television? This is a great question. So I actually uh, just sat on a thesis committee for somebody who was really doing this. The American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics says no screen time for the first two years of life. That's the recommendation. This young woman did a study where she had children wearing a um, microphone system recording what was going on at home. And so she could hear talk around the child and talk to the child. At the earliest stages, talk around the child, including the television, didn't mean anything to the child, didn't show any rate of change. Talk to the child was associated with very rapid gains in both knowledge of words, but even speed of processing those words. But television did not contribute to that. Now, that begins to shift at some point, because you can learn a lot uh, from television when you're maybe three or four or five. So the recommendation of the American Academy of Pediatrics is no, no screen time during the first two years of life, limited screen time after that, and making screen time social. So again, I want to emphasize that warm social relationships really cement learning. And so if you sit with your child watching a television show, you know, Blue's Clues or something, Diego, um, and then you can talk about it, the child may get a bigger boost from that screen time than if the child is on his or her own watching. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Somebody's gonna ask about bilingualism in this crowd, right? Is it bad to, who, right? who wants to know about that? Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, so uh, the evidence is that children who have two languages are a little bit different than children who have one language early on, but they're not, they're not necessarily worse in any particular ways. Their, their rate of language development should be pretty much exactly the same as children who are exposed to a single language. Our thinking is that their boost is not so much in, as in vocabulary because they, it is if you look at the total vocabulary, but in either of their two languages, um, they may have less rich vocabulary than somebody else, but that does not interfere with communication. Our thinking is that their advantage may be in those executive functions like planning and inhibiting because the act of deciding which language to use may be exercising the parts of the brain that are about um, inhibiting and planning and switching code and so forth. So the, the current thinking is that there may be a slight boost for executive functions and there's a slight difference in language but not so much that you would see functionally. Yes? Yeah, what do you think about baby sign language? So baby sign language could be conceptualized as a second language. 
Um, in children who have to use sign language, let's say kids with hearing impairment, um, they, they tend to get words just a tiny bit earlier than children who are learning to speak. And one hypothesis is if you can see it, um, it may be a little bit easier than if you just have to process the words acoustically. Um, but most parents aren't really doing sign language with their children. They're doing a few isolated signs with their children, and that's fine. I don't think, it doesn't give you much of a boost in verbal language because it's really not a whole language that you're exposing your child to. It's just an isolated bit of word. So you know if you said to your child, uh, you know, call me Ima, even though everything else is in English, they'll learn Ima, but they won't learn Hebrew, right? So um, similarly with sign language, if you use more and all done, um, but nothing else, they'll learn more and all done, but nothing else. Okay? There's no magic, there's no trigger that gets a language going. It's really this you know, effort, uh, you know, lots of exposure, and the child kind of managing to try and understand what's happening around. Okay? Yes? Jerry, yeah. <clears throat> great. That's a great question. So um, we do, we, we all hope for, pray for, expect a typically developing child. Um, and it, it's hard to know when you have a child who has delays or is at risk for a disorder because there's so much variation in the rate of human development. Um, so I usually say if a child is more than 25% behind what you'd expect for age. So if we expected a child to... Um, walk at around 12 months of age, and he's 16 months of age, so he's four months later than he should be, then I would get help. If we expect a child to have her first words at 12 months of age, and there's nothing happening at 18 months of age, get help. The American Academy of Pediatrics, which is my professional organization, would really like it if the first stop would be at the, at the pediatrician's office. And many pediatricians have geared up and are doing developmental screening, and there's a great website that you can all check out called Learn the Signs. And it's a, it's a joint effort. It includes the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Maternal Child Health Bureau and the American Academy of Pediatrics all working together so that the public and the professionals know the signs. Um, but um, if your pediatrician for some reason isn't so keen on doing developmental screening or doesn't seem to offer you much help, then I would try and take it to the next level, which is a pediatrician like me who specializes in development. And again, there's organizations all over the community, like Abilities United, where you can go maybe for some mild little bit of help, see how your child responds. But sometimes the best clue to whether a child is going to have long-term problems is how quickly they respond when intervention gets started. So rather than where they are at two, the question is if we really enhance the experience, we try and customize it to the child's learning, how quickly do they change between two and three? All right, it's been a real honor and privilege to talk with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Feldman. Okay, thank you. Have How a good day. Oh, perfect. Okay. How are you guys doing? She provided a lot of great information, so thank you, Dr. Feldman. If you guys have more questions, actually, Lucille Packard does have a table in the back, so you guys could wander through there and ask additional questions. Okay, so next we have Dr. Artie Jan of the Life Connections Health Center. Dr. Jan believes as a pediatrician her goal is to improve the 